scriptures and some of our main points uh, to help you follow along with our message today. There's also a small place for you to write down and take any notes, anything you'd like to remember and take with you. I hope that you'll do that. And if you open that on up, you'll also see our uh, prayer and study guide, and daily scripture readings that can help you to kind of go deeper in the message and spend a little bit of time each day talking and listening to God by reading the devotions and, and praying to God. So I hope that you'll take this with you and do that. But uh, we're in the middle of this sermon series, Moving Past Your Past. Uh, last week we talked about breaking the labels that bind us. If you weren't here, if you missed that, you know, all of our sermons you can find uh, online on our website. So there's a YouTube channel too, so you, if you miss a sermon, you can go back and try to catch up on that. But uh, next week we're going to be talking about when we've hurt someone else, how do we go and say I'm sorry and begin to initiate restoration. And then we'll kind of conclude this series by going and talking about how we can uh, move past our own personal failures. Maybe we failed at something and we don't want to let that define us. Or, or maybe it's a sin or something that we've gotten ourselves stuck into. And how do we move past that? Or maybe even that we know that God has forgiven us of what we've done, but we still have forgiven ourselves. And, and so how can God help us? How can the scriptures teach us to move into the future that God has for us? But today, uh, we're talking about a very difficult subject, forgiving those who hurt you. And we are people, and so uh, misunderstandings and, and hurts are bound to happen, unfortunately, in life. It's just part of life. Uh, I bet anyone in here, if I asked you, have you ever been hurt by someone else, we would all raise our hands, wouldn't we? You know, because we've all been through that experience in some way, shape, or form. It could be that someone has betrayed you, you know, betrayed your trust, or you thought they were friends, and, and then they've gone off and acted more like an enemy. It could be that there was just a miscommunication or a misunderstanding. No one meant to hurt feelings, but hurt feelings happen. Or, or it could be that someone was under a lot of pressure and they kind of bit your head off and that didn't feel too good and it hurt. You know, and it could be that um, unfortunately a relationship just hasn't been right for a number of years, maybe in a family, maybe in a work relationship. And, and you've kind of received the short end of the stick many times over and over again. And so today we're going to talk about those things. They happen in our lives. And, you know, um, another thing is that many of us, unfortunately, carry, carry around these hurts with us or, or resentments or even bitterness um, because we haven't done the hard work of forgiveness or, or even been on that journey. And so what happens sometimes is that someone that has maybe hurt you or that you've had some kind of conflict with, uh, maybe at church, it could be at work, it could be at school, it could be in your neighborhood, but you end up in a situation in the same room with them. And, and these feelings begin to kind of grow up within you. It could be in a family gathering over the holidays, and you realize, well, I've been hurt by that person, and I don't know if I can even be around them, and that distance begins to grow. Maybe it's already been. And, uh, and then, you know, so you bump into that person, and all these feelings come rushing back, maybe a little bit of anxiety. And I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, one of the churches that I served, a uh, church went through a terrible amount of conflict, and most of it was generated by two staff members who were, frankly, just trying to make power plays. And they were antagonizing the pastors and hurting other staff and, and really kind of leading that church um, through their actions into a divisive kind of way. And there were a lot of hurt people in that situation. I myself got very hurt in this situation and, and very tough. And I you know, tried to work through forgiveness. But uh, years later, um, you know that uh, in the fall, one of the things I like to do, and Matt Patrick and Michael Wilder, we all went up to Church of the Resurrection in, in September, October to uh, kind of do a little continuing, uh, continuing education. And I remember the first time that I went to this event back in 2010, I'm sitting in their big sanctuary that holds a couple thousand people. There might have been 1,500 people, 2,000 people there. And I look up, and one row in front of me is one of those two staff members that had hurt me so very deeply all those years ago. And all those feelings kind of came rushing back. And one of the things I realized in that moment is that I still had some work in forgiveness to do. And so I only mention that story, not to go through any of the bloody details or any of that, but just to let you know that I stand up here as a pastor, but as someone who struggles with forgiveness from time to time, who, who attempts to work through forgiveness, and this isn't easy for any of us. So we've all probably been hurt. We've all probably hurt someone else at some point with our words or with our actions. And yet God gives us the hope and the grace and the possibility of forgiveness. And so uh, I'll say this too. When I preach on this topic of forgiveness, many times I'll get some kind of pushback from one or two people, maybe in an email, maybe in a conversation. It usually goes something like this, you know, uh, someone will say, well, you know, Pastor, 
so-and-so hurt me so bad, and you, you don't know what they did to me, and, 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 and you say that I'm supposed to forgive them. And, you know, these kinds of sermons can bring up those feelings in us, maybe that we forgot we even had with a certain person or, or a certain situation. And I just want to say very clearly, I don't know what someone did to you. You know, what so-and-so did in this board meeting or so-and-so did in this class or, or in your neighborhood or in a family situation. But I can tell you that this is one of the greatest gifts any of us can receive from God is the ability to begin to work toward forgiving those who hurt us. Uh, it will bless you in so many ways. And so to kind of get at this topic, I want to kind of address five questions about forgiving those who hurt us. And here is the first one. Does forgiveness mean that we are condoning what the person did? Does it mean that they didn't, what they did really wasn't that bad? Does forgiveness mean we're condoning what the person did? And the answer to that is no. Uh, no, we're not saying, you know, when we forgive someone that they didn't do something that really hurt. Thomas Hopko is an Orthodox priest, and I remember reading an interview with him when I was in divinity school. And this little quote I've given you in your notes today really stuck with me. I thought he said it so well. He says this, uh, by definition, forgiveness is breaking the chain of evil, beginning by recognizing that evil really has been done. People tend to think that forgiveness means something bad was not really done, that a person didn't understand the consequences or whatever. Forgiveness has to admit and rage over and weep over a real evil and then say, however, we're going to live in communion one with another. We're going to carry on, never forgetting you. We can't at any rate, but carrying on in a spirit of love without letting the evil poison the future relationship. I really believe that is said so well. You know? So one of the things I hope you understand is that when we forgive someone, we're not saying that you really didn't do anything bad. I'm going to use Matt as an example. If I were to just look over to Matt and say, Matt, I forgive you. Matt's response would immediately be, what did I do? Right? And the reason is that when we say, I forgive you to someone, we're accusing them in some way of hurting us. But then we're not just leaving it there. We're going on and saying, but... Because of what God can do in our lives, and the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit can move, we're going to work toward forgiveness, and, and it's going to be okay. That's what that means. So, so that's our first uh, question today to answer. Here's another one. Does forgiveness negate the consequences? So if I forgive someone, does that mean there will never be any consequences for that person? Now, there may be some times where we're in a position to wipe away the consequences in an act of grace, and that, and that can be very generous to a person. But many times someone has done something and the consequences are beyond our control even if we choose to forgive that person. If, you know, if, if uh, uh, you've seen the, the radical stories of someone who murdered someone's child and they learn to forgive that person through that, the work of God, but that person who committed the murder still may have to go to prison, you know. Um, so there, there are still consequences many times. And sometimes um, we need to let those consequences stand or we can become an enabler uh, very bad behavior, uh, being kind of, you know, becoming a routine or a habit. Uh, so it doesn't mean that there are consequences when we forgive someone. Well, then you get into sometimes the, the very tough uh, possibility. Here's the third question. Do we forgive people when they've not repented? When someone's come and they've heard not come and said, I'm sorry. Are we supposed to forgive someone then? And I really think that there are kind of two senses of forgiveness. And here's the first one. The Bible calls us to forgive. Just as Jesus has forgiven us, as God has forgiven us, we are to forgive. And so here's the first sense of forgiveness. The internal letting go of the right to retaliation and giving up bitterness and resentment. In almost every situation, we're called to this kind of forgiveness, to letting go of the right to retaliation. You know, to, to giving up bitterness and resentment. And we really do this for ourselves so that we don't have to carry around that hurt with us, that resentment with us, that bitterness with us for the rest of our lives. So we're all called to work toward that. that that's a difficult thing. But here's a second sense of forgiveness, extending mercy to the other person so that they know you've released them from the guilt of their sin towards you. And I don't believe that we are always called to work toward this second. It requires kind of the coming together of two people, of someone coming and making an apology. And then we, we do need to work toward releasing them from that guilt, you know, uh, extending mercy to them and releasing them from the guilt of their sin towards you. But you can't usually have that kind of exchange without an apology. And so I just kind of want to kind of put that out there and, and, and thinking about that, 
that there are those two senses of forgiveness. So that kind of leads to our fourth question. Why? Why should I forgive someone who hurt me? Why, why, why do we do that? Well, I want to give you kind of two biblical concepts that kind of guide us in thinking of why we should forgive someone else. And here's the first one. Unforgiveness hurts me. You know, let's just start there. Why should I forgive? Well, unforgiveness hurts me. I love the writers of Hebrews. He says this in chapter 12, verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. Now, so many of us, we live with the bitter root in our lives. We just kind of get used to it. And we're not even completely you know, cognizant that it's there all the time, but kind of a grudge begins to be held somewhere in our hearts. And we've learned to continue with the root of bitterness that grows deep down in the soil of hurt. You know, and it does that when it's not dealt with properly. Now Paul, he says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Isn't that a great thing, you know? I love to bring out that verse when we do premarital counseling, you know, like, hey, you all are going to get married, and it's going to be great on that way, Dave. There's still be an argument coming in. Love keeps no record of wrongs. But guess what? Bitterness keeps detailed records of wrongs, right? Ooh. Well, he did, and she did, and she said, you know, and this happened. And you see the way they're walking around and the way they carry themselves. And there's this root of bitterness and it can literally become like a cancer eating away at our souls. And it eats away at us and hurts our relationship with other people and even hurt our relationship with God. Why should we forgive? Well, unforgiveness is like grabbing broken glass in our hands. It hurts us. Now, uh, Let's see. Any of you ever play Angry Birds on your phone? No, it's the number one app of all time. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have it, and I don't have it on my phone, I'll admit that I have played it on someone else's iPad. And let me just tell you about Angry Birds for just a second. It's a little game, and you're a bird. You're an angry bird. And for some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason you hate the pigs. And you want to bring destruction upon their lives. Now the pigs have built little structures, little buildings and stuff. Sometimes they're made of wood, sometimes they're made of metal. But you want to destroy the pigs and their structures and everything about them. And so thankfully, you, the angry bird, have a little slingshot that you can put your little angry bird self in and launch. And the angry bird flies across it. And when it hits to the pigs, the other thing, it hits the ground. And what, you know what it does? It blows up. And you can destroy the pigs. Now, I don't know. It's a silly game. But my point is that if you really want to be an angry bird and be blowing up all over you, it hurts yourself to do this. Anyway, uh, one last little kind of image for you is that when you're unwilling to forgive, it's like drinking a bottle of poison and hoping that it hurts the other person. It hurts you. And so why should we forgive? Well, we start with the basic and, and selfish reason that unforgiveness hurts, hurts me. Here's another reason why we're called to forgive. I will need forgiveness again. I'll just confess to you, I need forgiveness basically every day of my life. Uh, each day, I hope it goes better than the last, but I'm still, you know, say something or, or find myself in sin, and I need forgiveness again and again. And the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, He said, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will will not forgive you, your sins. So Jesus drills this point in through other sermons, other teachings that he does over and over again. And one of the most powerful stories he tells is one we call the parable of the unforgiving servant. You can read it when you go home today, Matthew 18, 23 to 35. But I'll remind you of what Jesus talks about in this parable. He tells of a king or a master who calls his servants together to reconcile their accounts with them. And he has this one servant who owes him 10,000 talents. What's a talent? Well, a ta one talent is 15 years of wages from what, of labor. You know, so what you would earn working you know, wages for, for 15 years. And this guy owes him 10,000. So 150,000 years of labor is what he owes. If we translate it to dollars and cents, it's a little over $2 billion. So the people hearing this parable from Jesus, 
they realize very quickly this guy could never repay the king, the master, what he owes him. And so the master says, I can pay up. And this servant, he begs for mercy, he falls down on his knees, and he says, Oh, master, oh king, please be patient with me. I'll repay everything if you'll just be patient with me. And the master, being gracious, hears this plea for mercy and grants it to him. He even wipes out the entire debt. But surprisingly, this servant goes out that day and he goes straight to someone who owes him the equivalent of maybe $2,000. Grabs him by the throat and says, pay me what you owe. And just like he had begged before, this poor fellow begs, be patient with me and I'll repay you everything. But this man extended no mercy to his fellow servant. He had him thrown in debtor's prison until he should repay the debt. The people were watching. The other servants were watching. They were quite concerned by this. And they go back to the master, to the king. And they report to him what this servant has done and not showing mercy to his fellow servant. And the king summons him back. And, and here's how Jesus tells him, beginning in verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And Jesus says, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Very direct, very interesting. And one of the things I know about me is that I am very interested in God's grace and mercy and forgiveness when it is being applied to me, when I am in need of it. And maybe, if I'm honest, I'm not always so quick to be as interested in it when it's applied to someone who's hurt. And yet Jesus calls us to forgive. So why should I forgive? Unforgiveness is really bad for me. I will need forgiveness again. And then most of you may, you know, you've been Christians a long time, you know that you're really, you know, hey, forgiveness is part of it. It's what we're called to. But you may still say, I want to forgive, but I am not sure how. So how do I forgive? I mean, how do I forgive someone who's ripped my heart out? How do I forgive someone who's trampled on me or hurt me or hurt someone that I love. You know, oh, you hurt me, fine. I can forgive but hurting someone I love. Oh, my goodness. Hey, if I'm supposed to do it, how do I do it? And I want to give you just a couple of thoughts from scriptures and that I pray will kind of land in your heart. And the first thing, pray first. Pray. Pray about it. Start with prayer. Pray and praying for those who hurt you. And, you know, don't pray for them to get camera ways. Or don't be tempted to pray, oh God, I pray that you will strike this person down with lightning. There I prayed for them. No, no, that's, that's not the spirit we're going for. No, we pray like Jesus prayed when he was on the cross. When he was nailed to a cross. How did he pray? Father, forgive them. That's his model prayer for us, even as he's dying on the cross. Father, forgive them. Once again, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said. So he's saying this is a, a popular teaching. This is what most people think. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that was normal in his day. In fact, the Romans even kind of worshipped the God of revenge. And so we hate those who've heard us. And the Jews taught an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. And even that was put in place by them to uh, keep you from retaliating by upping the enemy. If someone took your eye you could go take their life was the goal there. But that was the teaching of the day. He says, you've heard that said. That's pretty normal. And that's where most people live. And he says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And chances are pretty good at some point. Most of us will say, but yeah, I really don't want to pray for them. I don't really feel like praying for them. But I found that oftentimes it takes right actions to trigger right feelings. I mean, let's be honest, we never really feel like going and working out. We probably never feel like, oh, I want to pray for my enemies today. Wouldn't that make me feel good? You know? But if you wait to have the desire, you, know, you may wait a long time. And so some things we just do, and we find that doing them increases our want to. To do that. I'll give you an example. Uh, my senior year at Divinity School, one of my best friends, uh, he just decided some things happened and, and he decided that he wasn't going to be my friend anymore. 
And he didn't tell me that. He just kind of stopped talking to me. It took me a little bit of time to kind of figure it out. I guess we're not friends anymore. And I remember at first when I figured that out, I was hurt. And that didn't last long. Then I got angry. Like, you know, how dare you not be friends with me, you know, or forget him. And it was a painful kind of falling out of friendship. But I knew that God calls us to forget. And so I began to pray. It wasn't easy to pray. You know, um, all I could pray at first was, Lord, help me to forgive him. And when you pray God's blessings on someone who's hurt you, you kind of do it first with a clenched jaw and a, and a, you know, a tight fist. You know, oh, God, forgive them. You know, it's not easy to do. And I'll tell you that I have found that my prayers for others may or may not change them. But they almost always change me. And I was still upset with my friend when we graduated and still were really on speaking terms. And another year went by. And I'll be honest with you, I don't remember who called who. Whether he called me eventually or I called him. But we talked and we both kind of apologized. And we began to experience kind of the reconciliation that only God can bring. And I can tell you that on that day I forgave him. God set the prisoner free and the prisoner was me. And our friendship grew even stronger than it was before to the point that he was in my wedding and I was in his wedding. And it was a real blessing. So pray. And this may be difficult at first. I don't want to minimize the pain we go through when we've been hurt. But you start there and you let God be a work in your life. The Holy Spirit moving and doing things in you that you can't do yourself. And so you can say, I choose to forget. And for others it might be a process, but I'm telling you, work on the process and it starts with prayer. All right, the second thing I want to encourage you to do is this. Forgive as you've been forgiven. You know, it changes our perspective when we can sit down and think and remember that God has forgiven us, Jesus has forgiven us, and so much. We also, most of us, experience the forgiveness of other people, of other Christians, of other family or friends. So how do you forgive? I mean, how do you do it? Well, the same way that God has forgiven you. The same way that Christ has forgiven you. He paid a price in order to offer forgiveness to us. I love what the Bible says. We use this verse in our call of worship today. It's another one I really enjoy, you know, bringing up sometimes with uh, premarital counseling. But verse 13, Colossians 3, 13. Bear with one another. You know, sometimes that's what we just have to do. We just have to bear with one another. You know, we may not all be easy to live with all the time. We may have bad days, but we bear with one another. Why? Because we love each other. Because God's calling us together. We do that in the church. We do that in the family. You may do that in your workplace or, or at school or in friendships or groups of friends. But we bear with one another. And it may not be clean always. It might be a little bit of a mess. And you might still have to hang in there and work through some things. There may still be some pain on the other side. But, but Paul says, bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. How do I do that? Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. You forgive as you've been forgiven. And, you know, how many times do I have to forgive someone? I mean, even doing it once could be hard, right? This is one of those questions that the disciples thought to ask. Peter thought to ask this of Jesus. He said, well, how many times should I forgive? Up to seven times if I forgive someone seven times, that'd be pretty good, right? And Jesus just looks at him and he says, not seven times, but 77 times. Or some translations say, seven times 70. So, Jesus' answer lies somewhere between 77 and 490 times. If you can keep track that much. What's he really saying to us? He's saying you just keep on forgiving. You live as people of forgiveness in the way of forgiveness. Wow. Now I want to clarify this. Some of you may now or may have at one point been in what might have been an abusive situation. Do we forgive and just keep being abused? No, absolutely not. You, you get out of that situation if you or someone you know is in a situation like that, talk to someone here at the church and we'll help you to get out of that situation and you can forgive from a distance. Forgiveness isn't about us continuing to be hurt and hurt and hurt. But I think the principle would be this. The forgiven forgive others. You know, that's what we do. That's what we're called to, to do as, as people who follow Jesus. The one who died on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so that's what I invite you to be working on. And none of us, you know, perfect this in our lives. It's not easy for any of us, but it's 
brothers and sisters of Christ, we can help one another to work towards forgiveness. And when you do that, it will allow you to let go of some of the pain, some of the bitterness, some of the hurts that maybe you've turned, been carrying around with you to truly experience God's healing in your lives. Probably none of us is exempt from these situations in our lives. They happen. And so if we can let God work in our lives to be people of forgiveness, man, it's a great, a great blessing to you and to me and to everyone that we know. Because it means when we mess up or when we intentionally even hurt someone, it doesn't have to be at the end of the relationship. God can do things that seem impossible to us. And so before I pray, I just want to let you know, in this next song, we're going to invite you to come forward if you would like to receive anointing with oil on the back of your hand or on your forehead. And we're going to be saying to you to receive healing in the name of Jesus Christ. And maybe healing from hurts that are inside that are not visible. Uh, it could be other forms of healing to you. But we want to offer this to you as, as a gift today. So uh, let us pray. Oh Lord, we love you. And we thank you that you love us so much. That even when we do what's wrong, even when we hurt you, even when we hurt others, that you offer us your forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And you also don't stop there. You put your forgiveness in our hearts so we might be able to forgive others in the name of Jesus. And I pray today that all kinds of relationships might be restored over a period of time through a process of forgiveness. Relationships between parents and children, between friends, between co-workers, between fellow Christians, Lord. We pray that you would lead us to be people of forgiveness to offer forgiveness so that we don't have to carry around the bitter roots of resentment and hurtfulness. Lord, heal us where our hearts are today. Bless this oil that it might anoint us in a way that makes the Holy Spirit very real to us in each of our lives. And guide us in your path, Lord. Help us to not only receive your forgiveness, but to offer it to others 